lot of times I get asked about my courses, and when I bring up kinesiology, a lot of people ask, but, but why? Well, while kinesiology is the systematic study of physiological, psychological, and sociological aspects of human movement and how it can be optimized, the content learned is not limited to science or abstract fields. In fact, a lot of the knowledge in kinesiology can be applied into animation. Check it out. For the simplicity of this video, we will be focusing on a specific sport and a specific skill. Let's say you're an animator and you want to make a show, a feature, an anime, about softball, but you don't actually know anything about softball. I didn't know anything about softball, except maybe for the fact that it probably has a softball. It doesn't. Before you do anything, you have to familiarize yourself with the history and the rules of the sport. To begin, softball can be played in three ways, fast pitch, slow pitch, and modified fast pitch, all of which have underhand pitches. In each inning, one team is batting while the other is fielding. The ones batting are in offense, while the ones fielding are in defense. An inning ends once three people are out from the offense team. If you decide to make a long-term show about softball, you may want to familiarize yourself with the periodization of the sport. Periodization is the overall training plan separated into distinct training periods in an attempt to maximize performances at peak times while reducing the risk of injury and mental burnout. Keep in mind what your character should be doing during pre-season, in-season, and off-season. Now that we've familiarized ourselves with some of the basics about softball, which will help us develop a believable story, we can now move on to creating a character to animate. I will be modifying my character for my media arts short film, Mango. When designing a character, it's important to keep in mind the growth and development of human beings. The human goes through cephalocaudal growth, meaning the head develops first. In other words, if your character is a child, their proportions should be modified so that the head is slightly bigger than average. Mango has a relatively large head, but that's just because I like drawing cute characters, and cute usually means bigger head. Another thing to keep in mind are modifications for younger athletes. In softball, the equipment like bats and balls can be reduced in size. The field can be shrunk as well for younger players. Little kids who are new to softball usually play a modified version of the sport called t-ball, where there is no pitcher and the ball begins static. Next, clothing. Softball usually takes place during the spring or summer, so it's going to be hot. If your character is wearing too much clothing, it can block up to 50% of the body's ability from cooling itself. So, if you want a functional character, try to give them loose, breathable, sweat-wicking, and light-colored clothing. Now that we have a character and some background information, we can move on to understanding the human body and how it moves. Before we do anything, I like to do a few gestures as warm-up before analyzing the actual movement. As an animator, it's important to know how to gather references and not only observe, but analyze its functionality and its physiology. Knowing the phases of movement will also help in determining the keyframes of your animation. In the preliminary movement, the athlete is in an athletic stance perpendicular to the pitcher to help with the winding up that will occur in later stages. The direction of the body is dependent on the batter's dominant side, the non-dominant foot in front. In the athletic stance, the legs are slightly bent, the feet perpendicular to the pitcher, and with more weight on the dominant foot. This stance shows the first biomechanical principle of stability, because the center of mass is lowered and closer to the base of support when the knees are bent, along with a wider base of support because the feet are shoulder width apart or slightly more. The grip on the bat should be firm with the dominant hand on top and the elbows should be elevated. The bat should also be behind the head to ensure maximum rotation. The eye should always be focused on the ball. These details are important to note when animating so that the movement is believable, accurate, and functional. Be careful in deciding your character's dominant side as you will have to stick to it if you're animating them several times. In the backswing movement, more weight is transferred to the dominant foot while the non-dominant foot plantar flexes. The arms are brought further back in order to wind up even more to gain maximum momentum. Even if this is a small and almost undetectable movement, the backswing can be seen as one of the principles of animation, the anticipation movement, which can give your animation more life and prepare viewers for the main action. In 
the force producing movement, the weight is shifted from the dominant foot to the non-dominant foot. The swing begins from the hips, then goes to the core, then upper arm, then forearm, displaying the biomechanical principle of maximum force and velocity, as all joints are being used in order of largest to smallest. The swing demonstrates the biomechanical principle of angular motion, the internal force being applied away from the axes. The body twists across the longitudinal axis and on the transverse plane. The weight transfer is done with the help of the back leg's plantar flexion, done from the hips to the knees then to the ankle, creating maximum velocity and force. Both weight transfer and angular motion help in creating momentum. During the critical instant, the arm should ideally be fully extended as the coordinated joint rotations, weight transfer, and angular motion continue from the previous stage. In the follow-through phase, there should be an uninterrupted backswing across the body, now with most of the weight on the non-dominant foot in front. At times, the back foot may be in plantar flexion. At this stage, the batter should prepare to run if the ball has been successfully hit. The face can be seen as one of the principles of animation, the follow-through or recovery of an action. The weight of the bat along with the momentum will cause the body to remain in motion even after hitting the ball. Now that we've analyzed the phases of movement and why it works, we can dive in and look at the skeletal and muscular system to gain a better understanding of the internal structure. After all, no matter how whack or exaggerated a character becomes, a good foundation and structure needs to be present in order for it to be a good and believable character. For the sake of simplicity, we will not be going over proportions and we will be drawing a simplified version of the skeleton. Here I have drawn a few simplified skeletons which correspond to the phases of movement. Some bones to note in the arm include the scapula, the humerus, the radius, and the ulna. The scapula slides along the back of the ribcage to move the arm. In pronation, the radius actually crosses over the ulna, and the elbow is a hinge joint. The torso includes the spine, with 33 vertebrae, 7 cervical, 12 thoracic, 5 lumbar, 5 fused sacral, and 4 fused coccygeal. You also have your egg-shaped ribcage and your bucket-shaped pelvis, two very important structures in drawing. The hip joint is a ball and socket joint. In your legs, you have your femur, which connects to your pelvis, your patella or kneecap, your tibia, your fibula, and your tarsals. The ankle is a plain joint. Moving on to the m muscles. Well, only the main ones. The sternocleidomastoid and trapezius are responsible for flexing or rotating the head to the side. In the preliminary movement, arm and elbow flexion are done by the pectoralis major, deltoids, brachiobrachialis, biceps brachii, triceps brachii, brachioradialis, and pronator teres. The trapezius also helps with the elevation of the arms. For the dominant arm doing abduction, we have the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor. For the non-dominant arm abducting anteriorly and medially, we have the pectoralis major, latissimus dorsi, subscapularis, trapezius, deltoids, coracobrachialis, and teres major. In the legs, where there's slight hip flexion, knee flexion, and leg abduction, there's the tensor fasciae latae, sartorius, iliopsoas, adductor brevis, gracilis, biceps femoris, semimembranosus, semitendinosus, and gastrocnemius. In the backswing movement, the dominant arm is further abducted by the muscles mentioned earlier. The non-dominant arm is also further abducted anteriorly and medially by the muscles mentioned earlier. The non-dominant foot plantar flexes to assist the weight transfer by using the fibularis brevis, fibularis longus, tibialis posterior, soleus, and gastrocnemius. In the force-producing movement, the rotation of the trunk is done by the rectus abdominis. The arms begin to extend and abduct anteriorly by using the latissimus dorsi, teres minor, deltoids, and teres major. In the legs, the knee continues to flex and rotates medially by using the tensor fasciae latae, gracilis, biceps femoris, semimembranosus, semitendinosus, gastrocnemius, and popliteus. The dominant foot goes into plantar flexion by using the fibularis brevis, fibularis longus, tibialis posterior, soleus, and gastrocnemius. At the critical instant, the arm should ideally be fully extended using the muscles mentioned before. The torso also continues to twist along the transverse plane and around the longitudinal axis. The legs and feet continue with their previous movements by muscles mentioned earlier. Finally, the follow-through phase consists of the extension of the dominant knee by the rectus femoris, vastus lateralis, 
vastus medialis, and vastus intermedius. The dominant leg returns to its original position through external rotation by the gluteus maximus, sartorius, and biceps femoris. In addition to bones and muscles, biomechanics can play a big part in the analysis. First, we have Newton's three laws. The law of inertia states that an object in motion stays in motion until acted upon by an external force. In our action, the ball stays in motion until it is acted upon by the external force of the bat swinging. The law of acceleration, where force equals mass times acceleration, is present because a heavier bat will result in needing more force to accelerate to the required swing speed. On the other hand, momentum, which is mass times velocity, is also present and suggests that if a bat is heavy but sufficient velocity is generated, it can create a large amount of momentum and that momentum can be transferred to the ball, sending it further and faster. In the end, softball players are encouraged to find what kind of bat suits them best. A few levers that are present in the movement are the neck, a first class lever, the foot in plantar flexion during the weight transfer, a second class lever, and the arm swinging the bat a third class lever. The internal forces present in the movement are the muscles pulling on the tendons. The external forces, which are just as important to consider when animating, include gravity, friction with the ground, and wind resistance. By applying some of these external forces in animating, animators can exaggerate them and make their animations more interesting. For example, the wind and friction from the sandy ground can create fancy dust clouds. The wind resistance acting on the ball can also be animated dramatically to give it some edginess. Phew! Now that we're finally done with our research and analysis, we can finally start animating. First, I'd like to establish the keyframes based off the phases of movement, keeping in mind specific positions of body parts in order to make it functional. Once that's done, I play around with the timing to see what needs to ease in and what needs to ease out. Timing, easing in and out are all animation principles. Timing for the swing will be very short, and there won't be a lot of frames because of how fast the movement is. Another principle of animation is arcs. When I drew the swing for the bat, I made sure the smears all follow in arc. From here, I just kept replaying the frames and adding in-betweens. When I'm cleaning up, I replay it, see how it goes, add some frames, remove some frames, edit, and until I'm happy with it. Now for some color. Well, here we have a basic animation based off the study we did. In conclusion, this entire project was an excuse to validate my choice in taking this course when I could have taken another arts course or even biology. But in all seriousness, even if kinesiology sounds like a super science course, a lot of it can be applied to different fields like animation. With kinesiology up your sleeve as an animator, you'll gain a greater understanding of the human body and the physics behind it, and maybe even some context on sports if you ever want to tell a story on it. So the next time someone asks me, why kinesiology? I'll be able to answer with this video, extend my arms with my latissimus dorsi, deltoids, and teres major while pronating my fist as my radius crosses over my ulna in the process. 